welcome to the Life's Best Medicine podcast, where we are finding hope and healing one episode at a time. No appointment needed, no rubber gloves, and no coping. Just a healthy dose of life lessons to help equip you for this wild journey we call life. Hello, everyone. It's August. It's almost go back to school time for the kids. Sorry, sorry that I have to be the bearer of bad news on that. But uh, my wife and I are actually traveling in the near future for some family obligations. And, you know, we were talking about the uh, airline sending out a preference for snacks. And we just laughed and said, we have simply snacking. We don't have to eat the, the those terrible little packs of, of pretzels and whatever they give you that aren't that great anyways. Um, have some good beef and chicken and be healthy for your trip. So I would recommend you do the same. So it's easy, convenient, great uh, company, great product. So uh, look up Simply Snacking. We'll have a link at the end of this podcast and uh, we appreciate their continued support and have a great August, everyone. September coming up next. Hey everyone, this is a friendly reminder that we are here for entertainment purposes only. We may not even be that entertaining at times, but this is not medical advice. You know, talk to your doctor, check with your healthcare professionals uh, before making any lifestyle changes or, you know, medicine changes. What we're talking about is our clinical experience and what we've seen. And so if you really want our advice, you can consult us. You can actually consult me as a doctor, or you can consult my guest and, uh, and get all your questions answered, but we can't give free medical advice because we can't pay our bills with that, but we can help to educate you a bit and allow you to think a little bit and always reach out to your medical professional before making any lifestyle changes. Thank you. Hello, and welcome back to the Life's Best Medicine podcast. I can almost 100% guarantee that you're going to learn something here, that you're, it's something that's new, because this is new for me. It's an area that in nutrition that I never talked about. So we have the world expert in this, the low ox coach, Monique Adinger. <laughs> Great, so great to have you. Thank you for for joining me. Oh, it's happy to be here, Brian. Happy to be here. Teach us, teach me and and my listeners about oxalate. So, give us your story. Like, how did it start? How did you start saying, okay, could this be affecting my health? And you know, let people know what what you went through and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, and it it's a great story because, um, it really shows how people can have a number of things going on that wouldn't be linked to oxalate. And yet that turns out to be connecting the dots kind of under the hood. Um, and so I was in my early forties. Um, I had kids late in life. So I had one at 40 and then I had the second one at 45 and I'd been seeing a naturopathic doctor who was kind of a functional med natural path because I was trying to optimize my health because I was trying to deal with really young kids and I was not a young mom. And um, it, it was really intriguing because I was one of those people, and I'm going to say this is a hallmark for people who have an oxalate problem, but I was someone who everybody said was doing everything right, in quotes, but I wasn't getting better. So here I am about 48, and my youngest then, who is about two and a half, almost three, was in the process of going through potty training and we were getting these rashes and they almost looked like chemical burns. Like I didn't think about hives at the time, but if I think about it now, they almost looked like big hives. And she also had you know, pain and soreness on urination. She was having some inflammation. Um, you know, I would put zinc cream on her because it wasn't my first rodeo as a mom. I was thinking maybe there's yeast going on here. And even though she was mostly done potty trading, still wearing a pull-up at night, so I was changing her in the morning. And she would weep. She was so sore. And I don't mean cry like a little one who's crying because they're frustrated or they're angry no weep and I was like what the heck is going on here so I took her to the functional med we'd all been seeing she'd been seeing him since she was born we had done the odd thing to sort of tweak her diet and stuff because she'd had some issues when I was nursing her if I had dairy or if I had 
was mostly things like, interestingly enough, in hindsight, tomatoes or spinach, or we'll talk more about that. Anyway, she would have problems. And so we were, we were doing some gentle herbal things with her. Anyway, I explain, you know, these rashes come and go. There doesn't seem to be a pattern. Not sure what I'm seeing. She's really sore, um, you know, not sleeping well. And he looks at me and he says, I think she has an oxalate problem. And what I remember is looking at him. I had been a nutrition geek all my life, always trying to do better. Looked at him and said, what's an oxalate? Because I had no idea. And thus we entered into the rabbit hole. Because what, what most of us don't know from a nutrition standpoint is that oxalate is this pro-inflammatory um, you know, disruptive plant toxin. And gradually over time, we've been telling people to eat more and more and more of it and kind of been completely unaware um, that it could be doing these kinds of things. So, so we get told about oxalate. I decide, okay, if I'm a good mom and I've got a fairly strong-willed almost three-year-old who knows how she's been eating. There's no way she's going to eat this diet unless somebody else does it. So I say to her, you and I are going to eat this diet together and we're going to figure out just how good it is. And never have I said anything so prophetic in my entire life. Wow. Because what started happening then is I'm eating this diet with her and I'm starting to feel better. And I'm like, huh? And it wasn't one thing at a time. So I'm 48 years old. At that point, I am probably clinically obese, although I stayed away from scales because they bothered me. Um, so I was really struggling with energy levels for multiple reasons. But even though I was on keto, I wasn't getting energy back. So obese, low thyroid, low adrenals. I'd had a cortisol test done and it showed that I had a kind of a funny pattern over the course of 24 hours. Um, muscle pain, joint aches. Uh, I took handfuls of digestive enzymes to try and digest my meals. Uh, this crazy insomnia where I'd fall into bed like a dead person at like nine o'clock and I would wake up wide awake at one and then I would be awake for a number of hours and then I might be able to get back to sleep for an hour or two and then I had to get up because I had young kids and you know parents need to be on deck then and and the challenge in part for me was that none of these things kind of looked like the others right like maybe adrenals are related to your thyroid and maybe your digestive problems are related to some of your issues with your nutrients not being at their right levels and you know, you're taking some things for insomnia, it's not working, you know, maybe you just got a, you got a lemon for a body. <laughs> like essentially that yeah, was and kind then of sleep the deprivation and stress and all those things contribute in. You say, why am I tired all the time? Yeah. And so, you know, maybe it's your stress, maybe it's your 40 and you've had kids. So like people were pointing in all sorts of different directions, but I really did essentially feel like I got a lemon for a body. So then we start doing this diet. Now I'm doing it. I'm all in because I want my daughter to be okay. I had, and, you, and you were already in doing a low carb ketogenic diet. And I that was wasn't really everything I could think of, like to try yeah. and be healthier. And, you know, yeah, I was already doing low carb. I was already doing keto. I was eating every day, almonds, spinach or chard or beets, um, you know, I was doing all the right stuff, nutrient dense, very low carb. Those are four of the heaviest hitters in terms of oxalate that there are out there that we still call food. Uh, it's very intriguing to me. So here I am on this low oxalate version suddenly, and I'm having to drop out a bunch of things and find substitutes. And what I watch is all of my problems concurrently all start to improve at the same time. And I go, what's that? <laughs> and, you know, long story short, I went from 
honestly thinking I wouldn't live to see my kids grow up because I was struggling so much. And while I didn't have a big diagnosis yet, I didn't have chronic fatigue yet or something else, I could see them all coming down the pipe at me. And, and then all of a sudden my energy was back. I was sleeping better. The first thing to fix itself was my digestion. All of a sudden I'm digesting my food. Okay. So that really got me intrigued and I just dove right in. So you know, here I am at 61, like. And you don't 14. look it, that's not fair. Well, that's, it's, I'm so glad that's like, but see, that's the testimony. I can show you pictures of when I was in my fifties. Um, and I was 50 taking a five-year-old to school for kindergarten. So we must keep this in mind. I was 45 when I had the second one. So I did get mistaken for my daughter's grandmother when she oh, was geez. in kindergarten. And that was ouchy. That was very ouchy. People and... always, always ask how you're related. Don't make an assumption. <laughs> I've seen people say crazy stuff. Oh, is this your mom? No, it's my wife. You know, stuff like yeah. that I've seen. I was like, oh, no, don't say it. I had a resident that I worked with that he always said the wrong thing. I was like, oh, no, just don't say anything. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's terrible to hear when you're trying to, you know, a young mom and all these other moms are like 20 years old, 22, you know, and you're. Yeah, dropping your kids yeah. off. And see, I still looked, I'd been on a low oxalate diet by the time I took her to school for about a year and a half. I still, my body was still struggling. But now, the, like the testimony to getting your diet right is, you know, I have energy, I feel good, I have enthusiasm, you know, I, 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 I'm living, I'm living a good life now. And I, at that point, I was really struggling to just kind of do what I needed to do as a, as a new parent. And I think that's an important point that you're making for practitioners, myself included saying, okay, you know, a lot of people believe, and I, and I've talked to some of the world experts go, you put them on low carb diet and everything gets better. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes we see in the gut, why are they struggling still mentally? Why are they still having, so we have to look at other things like, you know, the gut microbiomes one I've looked into. And also with the oxalates, you say, well, if you're eating a, as a matter of fact, what we see is a lot of people go low carb and they go, okay, I'm just eating my cookies and donuts and cake. And they're all just made with almond flour. So I'm okay. And, you know, artificial sweeteners. And so they don't realize that that could be a big part of the problem. Well, and almond flour, honestly, um, a, a te technically, like if you want to go to like a textbook definition, a low oxalate diet is about 40 to 60 milligrams of oxalate a day. But a lot of people will do fine at like a medium intake, which is over 60 to 100. And, and so for me, a hundred sounds like a lot of oxalate because I would never eat that high anymore. I just do better when I stay very low, but an, an ounce, like a quarter cup of almond flour is 400 milligrams of oxalate. So let's just put that in some perspective. You get one of those big almond flour muffins, you're, and it's, let's say it's got dark chocolate chips in it and, you know, macadamia nuts or pecans or something right you're probably holding in your hand 600 700 milligrams of oxalate like so if we if we put it in perspective even to a medium oxalate diet you could be having one serving of something that's essentially seven days worth of oxalate and then the problem is can your body get rid of it well, what's the bandwidth on your kidneys who do a lot of the work? How much can your gut take? Because we can actually secrete oxalate back into the gut to get rid of it. But, you know, if everything's struggling with this really high diet, then the, the next challenge is bioaccumulating it, which I think is happening more often than people realize. And when we're accumulating is it's causing more inflammation, right? That's what we're trying to absolutely get the rid problem, of in a, in a low carb diet. The problem with oxalate is the inflammation. So that's, that's really the, the hallmark here. If you have chronic inflammation, you're doing everything right. And you're not getting rid of it. The first thing I would look for is oxalate. Can other plant toxins be affecting you? Sure. But I don't think anything's got the amount of punch that oxalate does, both from a physical standpoint and a biochemical standpoint. So from a physical standpoint, kidney stones, we all know about kidney stones, right? So oxalate is a mineral chelator. 
it finds what I call its preferred dance partners, calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, copper, mm. things that are important to us. We don't really want to lose them. It binds with those, right? And then when the kidney's scraping that out of the, out of the bloodstream, the problem is this is insoluble oxalate. It'll precipitate out and then you get stones. Well, we look for kidney stones. Turns out that if you have uh, a case of arthritis, which is kind of not operating in a, in, a, in, a, in a diagnostically correct way, I'll say, like if you've got um, arthritis where it's giving you spikes sort of randomly or yeah, you can't fit into a diagnosis. And interestingly enough, I was one of those people. At one point I was dealing with what um, a rheumatologist told me was either psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, but I wasn't quite matching up to either one exactly. Um, the research now shows that those people can have oxalate crystals in the joints. And at the time when I made changes to my diet when I had that, I was doing my master's in library and information science degree back in the 80s. And I had access to online databases before the rest of the world did. So when I had when I had this problem, I'm one of those people who wants to dig in and understand, and I'm insatiably curious. So I started doing research on medical databases. And what I did was start to change my diet and make it a little more anti-inflammatory. And I took gluten out of my diet, which is actually a pretty rich source of oxalate as well. An amateur compared to almonds, but, but pretty good. So when I took that out of my diet, I actually dropped my oxalate and I started to improve. And I didn't realize why it was. I thought it was gluten. I, in hindsight, I think it may have also had something to do with oxalate. But when my rheumatologist was trying to get fluid off one of my knees, a nasty process if ever there was mm -hmm. one, yeah. um, she couldn't get clear synovial joint fluid. The inside of my knees were bleeding. So in like in the rear view mirror, I'm going, oxalate crystals? Could that have been why? those joints were so bad. And once I lowered oxalate in this big source in my diet, because I wasn't eating any gluten things, and I didn't replace with another kind of bread. I This was the beginning of my low carb journey as well. When I did that, yeah, I was getting some inflammation drop. I was getting, you know, benefits to all my joints. Eventually I was able to come off all the arthritis drugs I was on at the time. And so um, that also set me up to be my, the nutrition geek I became later and then retrained to be a nutritionist because yeah, and you're a holistic nutritionist I'm a, a holistic nutritionist now I went back to college in my 50s because I went this is life-changing this diet has been life-changing so what do I really want to do I want to do something I'm really passionate about where it really makes a difference and yeah, this is an area, it's a niche where you don't hear, I don't hear anyone else talking about it. So, you know, in my brain, I'm thinking back to, you know, to when we see well, back in the day, we saw kidney stones. Uh oh, those are calcium stones. Stop eating calcium. And then their oxalate would build up and then they would get more issues, right? They would have more stones when we cut the calcium, which seemed like the obvious thing to do. And then you realize, oh, if you give them more calcium, you bind the oxalate in the gut and get rid of it. And the other and thing- And you get rid of it. Exactly. With and magnesium that, too. Magnesium supplements, a lot of magnesium people- Magnesium works really well as well. Yeah. So do you think is it one of the big mechanisms probably binding the oxalate and getting rid of it? I think this is a huge part for people's diets, right? It's one of the things that, you know, occasionally people want to cheat with the odd higher oxalate food. And- Usually the one they want to cheat with is chocolate. And I would be in that category too. So chocolate's really high oxalate, but it tends to be um, either bound to magnesium in chocolate or a free available oxalate ion. And so if you take some minerals while you have your little treat. So I don't do this very often because my body doesn't really like oxalate, but you know, hubby and I will have a date 
We'll go out to this little local chocolatier. We'll have an exquisite little espresso and an exquisite little truffle. And I'll probably get one that's not dark chocolate. And I might get something that's a cream filling. So I'm really not overdoing anything. But then I'll take like a calcium magnesium supplement with it. And what that does is provide the minerals in the gut. So as the oxalates freed up from the chocolate, it's got its preferred dance partner and it can leave the body. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not totally a get out of jail free card because turns out you can actually get intestinal stones and they can actually be oxalate based. So if you're over using that strategy, like think about it as these little micro crystals moving through your gut and leaky gut and gut inflammation is a huge thing. Right. Well, if you're running sandpaper through there all the time, it's not going to be happy. Right. So I was really surprised for myself how quickly my gut started to repair itself when I took oxalate down. It's not that I didn't take minerals as a, as a support and do that kind of thing. But, you know, think about it. We were we were helping people with kidney stones by having them not take in calcium, which is a needed nutrient. Why wouldn't you just take the anti-nutrient out? Yeah. And, and the other thing you, you mentioned, uh, so dark chocolate is going to have more oxalate than uh, milk chocolate? I'm really sorry to tell that, yes. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of us doing low carbs say, okay, I'll just have dark chocolate. And so people are having dark chocolate all the time. You know, I won't tell you I had a piece last night. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that that's one of those things where people don't realize that that may be a contributor. Like you have to look at that holistically and look and just don't say, okay, let's get rid of gluten. Let's get rid of sugar. Let's... And then we're adding in a bunch of stuff that can cause them. If you're trying to get anti-inflammatory, we look at all these different mechanisms, one being the gut, one being, you know, uh, hormonal levels and sleep and stress and all those other things that affect inflammation, but really saying, okay, which foods, you know, really figure out which foods affect you because what you can't get away with other people can. Right. Yeah. And I've had people ask me this, you know, um, one, one of my clients recently was like, well, you know, my 70 year old dad can sit down and eat practically anything. He's not really on any big medications. He takes like, I, th I think there was a blood pressure pill or something. And, you know, how come he can do that? And like, I'm a man in my forties and I'm having problems. And I went, here's the story of my Swiss grandmother. My Swiss grandmother died when she was 94, so pretty good genes, and she had smoked for over 70 years of her life. Like if I really were to count it, we probably would have to say almost 80 because she started in her teens. She never died of smoking-related disease. So we should all be able to smoke, right? Well, no, of course not, right? Because there's differing, there's differing vulnerabilities between people. Like even if you look at something that everybody would acknowledge as a poison, like arsenic, straight ahead arsenic ingestion, different people will be able to handle different levels of it, right? And so that that's also an issue with oxalate. So people will say to me, you know, well, it can't be true because I've eaten X food for my whole life and I've always been fine. And it's like, if you have no chronic inflammation, if you aren't already doing everything right and getting worse, if you're, you know, if you don't have any of these signposts, carry on because I don't know for sure, right? How the heck could my grandmother smoke for like 80 years and not die of something smoking related? I was, you know, it's then you have someone that. 40 who dies of a heart attack or, or lung cancer and you say, well, what the heck was it? They smoke for a few years, you know, and, and so it, you never know. Yeah. You try to minimize your risk as much as possible. Well, and my dad, her son, died at 48 with high blood pressure and had only smoked for a short time in his life. But, you know, who knows what damage smoking can do to you? Right. So, it, it, <laughs> right. Yeah. Or other factors, right. What you're eating, stress, life, you know, all those kind of things that play in. That's kind of why I did this podcast kind of saying, what about all the other stuff? Okay. You go low carb, you cut out sugar, processed food, but then what else can we do to maximize our health? And, and really with oxalate, it's not just that physical damage that we've been talking about. There's the biochemical piece. So, the reason this stuff can be bioaccumulating is that in your body, sulfate, like cell transporters that move sulfate, those can move oxalate. And so if oxalate's really rich 
in the bloodstream, let's say your a, a liver cell goes out to, you know, pick up a piece of sulfate so it can run that detox process. Well, because that same cell transporter can move oxalate, if it runs into oxalate, it, that's an appropriate thing. It fits the end. It pulls it in. This is a bit of a thing, right? Because then you're not detoxing properly. But once oxalate's in there, it's not that it just hangs around, like hanging out, doing nothing. <laughs> it turns out it looks like it's a mitochondrial toxin. And so not only can your cell then not run the cell, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> not only can your cell then not run sulfation as it was trying to do, but you have this thing which is actively problematic for the mitochondria. That's not a good thing. I mean, how much talk is there now about the importance of the mitochondrial health? Right? Yeah, mitochondrial health. We're, we're, we're talking about that. We're seeing that a lot in different types of exercise, zone two training, different things where you say, let's protect the mitochondria. And then if you're pummeling it with all kinds of toxins, that's not going to help the situation. That's not a good thing. And then if you're not detoxing well, I mean, the problem with then how people talk about what's going on in the liver then i have clients who come to me and and someone said to them you know my detox pathways are blocked and i'll go your detox pathways are fine they are not blocked the problem is you've got bandwidth like this instead of like this and the reason for it is they're underfunded so if sulfate is the real currency oxalate is the monopoly money and of course your cell is going i can't do anything with that i, I you know i'm not I'm not able to run anything with that. You're going to have to take that elsewhere, right? So um, it, that's, I think, another sort of under-recognized issue with oxalate is that it's, it's being trafficked by some of our cell transporters, which can move it and move some other substance. And that's not working to our advantage either. Um, and from the standpoint of, of like getting into our system, some of it will move by passive diffusion out of the gut. So if you've got a high enough concentration in the gut, unless you're really oxalate toxic, your bloodstream is going to be much lower in oxalate. And so as a net result, it's going to passively diffuse through that, through that gut wall. And it's not because your gut is doing something wrong there. That's straight chemistry. And there's not a lot we can do about straight chemistry, right? But if you have leaky gut, you'd probably be absorbing more, I would assume, right? If you've got leaky gut, then you've got gaps between. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's giving your, your body a lot more opportunity to be taking up oxalate than it shouldn't be. So for people listening, who, 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 as far as your patients go, what are the telltale signs where they say, oh my gosh, this may be oxalate? Uh, probably the biggest one is that one that I've mentioned more than once, which is they're doing everything right and they're getting sicker. Um, because then there's something going on somewhere that's connecting the dots and it's not been obvious because they are doing all the other things that look correct. Um, so when you cut oxalate, did it make a difference in weight loss for you? Yeah, it made it easier for me to lose it because mm -hmm. I had more energy. So then I could you know, I could do some of the things that you want to be doing. Like metabolic health has a lot to do with being able to exercise. Your, if your muscles are using up um, glucose in your system, you're getting more insulin sensitive. It, it, made, it made a difference really across the board for me. Because then um, you have the energy to go. Because a lot of people say, I don't have the energy to exercise. And, you know, we always think it's metabolic from a insulin perspective and high insulin levels make you tired and all that. And high sugars, you know, pro-inflammatory, all that. And it feels terrible to exercise. So part of it's when you're feeling better, you're more likely to exercise, which gives you a more active lifestyle, which helps with, you know, not sitting around eating cookies all day yeah. while you're watching TV, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so feeling better made a difference to me being able to manage all these other things. Um, a lot of people who do have oxalate problems do tend to be overweight or be on the road to metabolic syndrome because we, we do know there's a relationship between kidney stones and metabolic syndrome. And so there's something there which may be contributing in some way. Um, if people have digestive issues, because the gut's ground zero, right? If I'm taking an oxalate via my diet, then the gut's really ground zero. So a lot of people who have oxalate issues will have gut issues. 
uh, if they have really intractable and chronic inflammation without any like real obvious trigger, um, I would be looking for oxalate there as well. Um, and interestingly enough, this there may be some relationship between oxalate and like mast cell issues. So people who start to have histamine intolerance, it looks like oxalate is driving the inflammasome. And once the inflammasome is being lit up around your body, then the mast cells are going to come to attention because they're the guards at the gate. We're looking for inflammation in the body because that means an infection or that means an injury, right? And then we're, we're on deck. And there are a lot of people who in this histamine intolerance world, they say, well, I've reduced all the histamine in my diet and I'm not getting better. And that's another place where if they've done everything right there, it looks like oxalate is a domino, which knocks over the, the mast cells, which then produce histamine and then away you are to the races. It's so like allergies and things like that can be worse. Yeah. My, my son, who um, he was like on this crazy addition of allergies when he was a kid, like um, they call it the allergic march when I was researching it. Like he was just adding things, adding things, adding things. And he was eating a really high oxalate diet like his mom. And so once my daughter was diagnosed, and note, my ND had been treating me for years, had been treating my son since he was little, didn't identify either of us as Oxlade people. But I, I found out there was a connection between asthma and other respiratory conditions, including COPD actually, uh, and cystic fibrosis, and those cystic fibrosis transporters, and Oxlade. And so I, I looked at my son who was at that point, you know, taking antihistamines like a food group and was on puffers and I, he was eight. So, and my kids were fairly smart. So I said, I want to propose an experiment. My kids might tell stories about this later. <laughs> my mother and her experiments I want to propose an experiment. Your sister and I are doing so well on this low oxalate diet. How about we try this for you for the summer? He said, okay, as long as I don't have to do it during school. I said, fine. So he also made me promise I would learn how to cook all of our family favorites. We haven't really talked about diet. That's my fun. That's the fun stuff for me. But he wanted me to learn how to cook all our family favorites in a low ox like way because he didn't want to change the way he ate. And I went, fair enough. So we started this summer long experiment about four weeks in, no puffers, no antihistamine. And I went, when September rolled around, he was going back to school. I was like, yeah, I think we're staying on a low oxalate diet, sweetie, because this has really worked. Wow. So, you know, he's now 21, um, has to do the diet himself, cheats occasionally because, you know, he's 21. And um, when I hear him wheeze, I know he's overdone it. And like, just recently, he was like, yeah, I got to get back on the diet because he was back on puffers. <laughs> and I'm yeah, like, that's amazing. We see the same thing with low carb, too, is that people, they go off and they go, oh, my back started hurting, my knees started hurting. I was trying to hide it from my wife, and then she knew I was eating cookies. And, you know, it's kind of funny. We do see that a, a fair amount. And so that helps with compliance, too, because people say, gosh, when I eat that way, I feel terrible. My stomach hurts. I'm, you know, all, all these other things pop up. And, you know, I, and, and the other thing I wanted to ask you about this this early morning awakening is a big nightmare for a lot of people. And does that seem consistent with a lot of people with oxalate uh, problems? Yeah. Either they can't fall asleep or this middle of the night sort of waking up at like two, three, four, and then just being awake. And I have a working hypothesis for what that has to do with, because I do think a lot of us who have um, oxalate issues are dealing with some level of histamine issue. And my understanding is that histamine is one of the things that the brain releases to wake us up during the day. It stays up during the day and then it drops for us to be able to sleep at night. Um, I think in the same way that oxalate can be impacting other kinds of hormones to some degree, um, and my cortisol was kind of weird, but I really wonder now about this business of I would eat supper, it would be a high oxalate meal, takes a while for the oxalate to digest, 
what if it's tipping over the histamine domino in the middle of the night and that histamine screaming up and I would wake up like wide awake like not sort of kind of dopey or drowsy like wide awake and the more that I sort of looked at what that could be related to the more I've kind of come down to maybe this is histamine but oxalate sitting out in front of it so it's a very common pattern for for folks in my practice I'd say easy 70 percent of them are having sleep problems maybe even more and it's very often this we wake up in the middle of the night we can't be get back to sleep for a while we might drop off again fitfully for a while and then we're kind of up for the day but yeah yeah and, and a lot of people are taking like hydroxazine or benadryl to sleep at night and you say well that exactly. kind of makes fits in with what you're saying you know that may be a histamine reaction to what yeah, you're having exactly. for dinner because the other thing that's interesting along those times i have i have people who change their diet go carnivore cut out processed food or giving up nuts and they'll say i sleep so much better now <laughs> so that could be that, that that definitely fits in with what i see clinically also well, and nuts are one of the highest oxalate food groups kind of in general, although just as a, a nice tip for people who might be reading along, especially if they like nuts, um, if they stick to things like macadamias or pecans or um, walnuts, those are not the heavy hitters peanuts and everything up from there are all the heavy hitters but those ones are kind of more medium oxalate but there's a new nut on the market that's come out from central america called a baru nut and we had those tested uh because i work with um the triangle oxalates group and thank heavens for those guys and susan owens when i was first learning about this diet because she was the original expert on oxalate and she ran this support group and that's where I learned about it. So I still donate some of my time there and volunteer. So we put foods through testing periodically to try and get more data points for them. And these Baru nuts for the same one ounce that would give you 300 milligrams with uh, almonds, it's 1.7. Wow. They are awesome. My problem is I, I can eat them. They're, they're, they're really palatable. Let me say that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's a problem, right? Then we go, oh, that, we like these. We can eat all these. But that's, that's an interesting uh, yeah. finding there. Baru nuts. Never heard Baru of Baru nuts. They're, they're really, they're a nice alternative. And, you know, that's some of the stuff that I cover when I, when I work with clients or, you know, if, if people follow me and, or, are getting any kind of dietary advice from me. How do you sub, right? How do you make the things you like and be able to find an alternative, right? Um, lots of people love potatoes, as we know. Now, if you've gone low carb, those have disappeared, which is good. And you're probably using cauliflower and options like that, which is very low oxalate, which is good. Um, but another one that I didn't know anything about until we went low oxalate here is radishes plain ordinary radishes turn out to be wonderful when they're cooked and so for my family who doesn't need to be low carb my kids are normal weight and my husband's actually thin and he likes his potatoes what we'll do sometimes is do the small potatoes peel chop boil but throw in unpeeled red radishes cut in half so it looks like you have potatoes because you have a red skin but you're only getting half the oxalate because the radishes are almost nothing and so there's things like this that we can do both both better for us if we're eating keto radishes you can do all kinds of things with yeah, as a matter of fact it's funny you say because i i've used it i've made a roast before and i throw in the radishes in the instapot and they come out great like my kids thought they were potatoes they yeah, didn't exactly. know you yeah. can't tell it and you think radishes have such a strong flavor but when they cook it, it's just really weird when they're cooked they're mild and sweet which is yeah. something you didn't know or or like sweeter tasting but for me they're my taste buds are are different probably than people who are still eating more sugar but to me they're mild and sweet and now my kids argue over who gets them out of the stir fry so it's kind of funny yeah that's cool so that's a great tip yeah using radishes so what are the things are you know when people tend to go low carb what are big things that become a problem with oxalates because i know yeah. spinach is high in oxalate are there certain rules we could follow or something that we can a simple way where we could say okay this is going to be a high oxalate food 
It's, it's tough to really be completely predictive because you can get exceptions like kale, where one form of kale is, is high oxalate, but another form of kale isn't. So unfortunately, it's, it's tougher than something like, I'm going to avoid dairy, so you know anything's got milk in it is a problem. Or I'm going to avoid gluten, so I'm not going to eat things with conventional flours in them. Um, each plant seems to have a somewhat different profile for oxalate, but um, the you can do yourself a world of good just by avoiding um, what I called the oxalate dirty dozen. So I came up with a dirty dozen of things that you should really avoid. So spinach, yes. Beets and beet greens, yes, avoid that too. Avoid chard. So those are greens that people really like in the low carb mm -hmm. world but you can go to radish greens turn out to be very good. Um, you know, kohlrabi greens. There are like a host of other greens that we can replace that with. Kale, conventional curly kale is high. Go to Lacinato or Dino kale, however you know, whatever name you know it by. That's a much better option. That's very low. So you can still have leafy greens. It's just changing who you pick. Um, Nuts are generally bad, but we've talked about my friend, the Baru nut. Um, rhubarb is actually the highest oxalate food we still wow. call food. It's about 750 milligrams and a half cup of stewed rhubarb. So that's definitely on my dirty dozen. Um, we did some fun... Um, uh, promotional stuff that I'm going to have out soon, like little posters for wanted bad guys. Um, so chocolate, unfortunately, is on there as well. Um, but again, it's like, can you find a lower no sugar chocolate, which maybe is dairy free because it uses coconut cream and but is not that really high cocoa percentage, you can probably still have it. It's some of it has to do with serving size and how you lay out your plate. Um, sweet potatoes are really bad. <laughs> potatoes are really bad. Um, turmeric, which has this reputation as being mm. anti-inflammatory. There is 50 milligrams of oxalate in one teaspoon of turmeric. Wow. So this golden milk thing out there has had my attention. What I would say for people with that is go to something like a curcumin extract. That's what's anti-inflammatory in the turmeric. And so you can buy that as a bulk powder. You can use that in your golden milk. Just don't use the whole spice. Wow. Um, Any another, other spices are like that? I yeah, know you did cinnamon, a talk on that too. Yeah. Cinnamon is a bad one. Um, oh, geez. Cumin is pretty bad. Uh, so a lot of the ones we really like are like really flavorful really great additions like chili powder things like variety that. some of those are really bad too i actually work with extracts when i can or um, there's a new company out of the uk which has like a spice drop and i don't know what magic they're performing there but those spice drops have really good intense and fresh spice flavor so I love them so that you know I do a lot of stuff with recipe development so that people can kind of you know get the taste they want but not the oxalate um, but cilantro wonderful uh saffron wonderful like there are spices that you could use um as a whole spice and do fine but I cook with curcumin powder so I still make chili um or I still make uh curries but I make them with this curcumin powder instead of using the turmeric. And then I get all the flavor and I get that wonderful color, but I don't get the oxalate. Mm. So what diet is the, like, if you look at all the diets that we're talking about right now, what, what's the ideal diet? Do you think like a carnivore diet is, a, it helps people with oxalates or does that make it, do, do certain meats and eggs and things have oxalates that are a problem? All your animal products are zero oxalate unless they're processed. So the good news for people, omnivores or carnivores, is that the meat that's on your plate is essentially zero oxalate unless it's been processed or you've added spices to it. So this is a really great way for people to be able to, you know, kind of balance their plate a little bit and 
be able to eat something that's got some oxalate in it with something that doesn't have some oxalate in it. They dilute the oxalate in the gut. They're less likely to passively absorb it. There's some benefits there. Um, what I'd say about a carnivore diet is while I tend in that direction, because I eat very low oxalate, the challenge is going from a really high oxalate diet where I had one client who had been taking in over 3000 milligrams of oxalate a day, crazy stuff, right? Doing a paleo diet. Um, for her to go directly to a carnivore diet, which is essentially zero oxalate intake, the challenge here is much like the kind of challenge that you have if you've had heavy metal poisoning. You move that stuff out too fast, it's really stressful for your body. It's so like uric acid. If we lower uric acid too too quickly in gout, they'll get a gout attack from lowering it too quickly. You have to be slow and, and steady. And that's really, you want to do something like that with oxalate as well. You want to step down. And interestingly enough, we've found out through the the oxalate support groups that help people with lowering oxalate, that sometimes if you eat a high oxalate food in opposition to some of this oxalate moving out of the tissues, the body will kind of go, oh, oh, so I can't do that right now. And so we can kind of moderate some of the impact of the oxalate leaving your system by working in opposition to what sort of looks like this for how oxalate leaves your body, kind of in waves from the tissues, and then it resolves, and then you get the next wave. Um, and it's not a short haul diet either. Like it takes time because if you've got oxalate, uh, which apparently can maroon in the bones, which kind of makes sense because calcium is one of its preferred dance partners, as I call mm -hmm. them. Um, that's going to take a while for that to come out because the bones remodel slowly, right? So there's a lot of factors to consider when bringing your oxalate down. Now, that said, full disclosure, I nosedived on oxalate as fast as I could do it because my daughter was in danger. She was having she was having problems. And we did like 15 years ago, we didn't know better. They didn't realize that you had to step down. And a lot of us did it really quickly. Um, I don't actually recommend that necessarily because there was some really um, unhappy uh you know, kinds of symptoms that I had as part of a really intensive dumping experience. So I ended up in ER once with me and ER once with my daughter. And so I wouldn't do that again, right? That's actually one of the things that I like to help people with because as somebody who's further down the road and has seen this stuff, I can help the ones coming behind me and say, oh no, you don't really want to do that. But it yeah. does make me wonder about this thing in the carnivore world where they talk about adaptation. I don't think it's adaptation. <laughs> I think that some of what's going on is oxalate moving out of the tissues. And when they, when they say to people, you know, just double down, eat more meat, eat more fatty meat, whatever, I suspect there's, there, there you could do this more gently than mm -hmm. just nosedive to carnivore and go yeah then maybe adding some oxalate foods to, to get started how about things like tea and and uh you know I, i'm just thinking of when the, when the people get in and sodas and diet sodas all that stuff how does that affect the oxalate system um tea can be fairly high in oxalate and unfortunately it's soluble oxalate the kind you're more likely to absorb right mm -hmm. So for people who are tea drinkers, if you drink it with milk, you're avoiding at least some of it because you're, you've got that binding action between the minerals and the milk and the, and the oxalate. But um, I actually don't, I don't really drink tea anymore. A little bit of decaf green because the decaffeination process brings down the oxalate a bit. But generally speaking, I'm now a coffee gal. So um, how about milk and like heavy whipping cream? Because a lot of people will switch over to that. Heavy whipping cream um, can give you some minerals that might help to bind, but it really depends on how well you're handling fat, right? So is there oxalate in, in the heavy whipping cream or not really? No, no. Oh, okay. The, the dairy is fine. Like any animal product. So like product. butter, animal products. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So the, but the challenge there is if oxalates impacted your liver, for some of us, if if we've had enough time to absorb enough of it, we can actually be having some problems with producing bile. 
And without the bile, you're not sequestering the fat. And what happens then is the calcium that's present in your heavy whipping cream or whatever is um, more likely to get sort of tied up with the fat and kind of a soapy kind of situation. And so then all of a sudden you don't have those minerals in the gut to do the job you really want them to do. So if, you're, if your body's handling fat well, you're producing enough bile, then you're, you're probably okay to be using that as part of your strategy to handle oxalate. But for somebody who's having a lot of digestive issues, like I was at the time, I was not producing enough bile. It, it wasn't helping me at that point. And from a clinical standpoint, if we uh, suspect it, are there certain tests that are helpful that we say, yeah, these are going to be consistent with high oxalate, or is it more of a clinical diagnosis? It's tough right now because I don't think we have tests where we're really looking for oxalate as the problem. <clears throat> So we have limited, limited things that you would be able to call on. Um, you can do a 24, uh, 24 hour oxalate assay, which will tell you how much oxalate the person is outputting in a 24 hour period. But what's really interesting about that test right now is that they've increased the range that they consider normal. So 15 years ago, when I first looked on the Mayo Clinic website, if I had a daily output of 45 milligrams of oxalate in my urine, I could actually be diagnosed as hyperoxaluria. That's not on their website anymore. Hmm. And I had one of those tests done. I managed to talk my doctor into it, even though I didn't have any sign of kidney stones. <laughs> but my doctor is somebody I know from before they became a doctor. And so I could, I could talk him into this. <laughs> so for a friend, he did this test. And... Um, I was outputting 293 milligrams of oxalate and that was considered normal. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, this range is weird. And he said, there's clearly something going on here, but he, he said, they're calling it normal up to 300 milligrams. And I said, I know exactly how much oxalate I take in a day. So well, it's because we have no so many sick there. people that are the normal now. So like with insulin, the same thing. We look at the range of insulin it's crazy. Like that's terrible. They'll say like 25 is normal. No, it's not. That's horrible. So, you know, things like that, that we, when you start to understand, you're looking at the physiology, you go, okay, if you, you don't want to be average, you want to be on the healthier end. So if so, you're outputting oxalate, like, 100 milligrams or more, I'd be looking for a problem. Um, you can get a blood test, Brian, but only apparently if you're in hospital and only if your kidneys are failing. So yeah, I've never checked it, never seen it before. Yeah, I don't. Uh -huh. I, I everybody I've talked to who has looked into blood tests, it's very hard to get an oxalate blood test. And again, we have no idea what the normal range there should be. Um, and the other one um, that I know about is the organic acids test. Um, and if clients haven't had one and they're interested in one, I'll request it from Great Plains Lab. That's the one that I'm kind of more familiar with. But there are other organic acids tests. And that'll give them their level of oxalic, glyceric, and glycolic, which are all related. But the, the thing with it is it's not a slam dunk because everybody reports the oxalate in a ratio to creatinine mm -hmm. and creatinine will vary depending upon what the kidneys are doing. And so um, unfortunately you kind of have to be able to look under the hood with that one to really figure out if oxalate is a real problem. But I've seen people have, again, crazy levels on, on an organic acids test too. Yeah. So I think this is great information and, and then also if people suspect they have high oxalate you said there's some cheats that we can do what are the cheats uh, is that more taking the minerals taking magnesium calcium things like that yeah so if you're starting out what i would say to people is first thing if you're not taking minerals just start taking minerals with your meal every meal right because in, a, in effect you're actually reducing your oxalate intake a little bit because it's binding them and then hopefully they're leaving and not being absorbed right then I would start to claw away, and most people don't eat the same thing every day, but then I would start to maybe claw away some of the really big heavy hitters, but I would leave some oxalate in, or I would look at measured doses of something to be able to act in opposition to, wow, I really feel crappy today, and maybe it's oxalate dumping, and then what do I do? So what I usually recommend to people is, let's try to move your baseline diet down fairly 
quickly, not overnight, but fairly quickly. But then we're going to leave these add-ins that are measurable and we know exactly what we are. And then we scrape those out. So I often use things like sweet potato because at least there's some nutrient density in there while mm -hmm. you're having oxalate. But it's not as hard to measure as something like spinach where you might have, again, 300 milligrams in half a cup. So how do you how do you start to scrape that away? And you don't want people having to measure a gram of something to try and figure out what they're doing, right? Yeah, and you just and you think about it, a lot of people are doing these green smoothies and they're putting a bunch of kale and spinach and all that. And I, I did that when I was really gaining weight. My wife was saying, we're going to do green shakes from now on. You know, and there's like, I'm feeling terrible. I didn't feel well with it. No, I didn't enjoy it. And I was hungry and I'm like, I don't like this. So, you know, but sometimes you kind of figure out maybe it's not a huge. And it, it, interestingly enough, when I went low carb, I started getting hives, rashes, all kinds of weird stuff. And I thought maybe I'm releasing toxins. Maybe it's ketosis. And I was like trying to figure it out. Turns out I had a parasite from one of my trips over to Guatemala, which didn't make things easier. But you wonder how it was certain when I had certain foods like almonds problem, wine, cheese, anything with mold on the outside of it. And then once I cut those things out, everything got better too, you know? So yeah. You wonder yeah. how much is the oxide. I know some carnivores who said they were getting hives and rashes, histamine response. They go carnivore goes away. Georgia Ede comes to mind that, you know, she cut it all out and she felt great. And she said, okay, this is my diet. And then she goes, maybe I'll add things in. But then she thought, I'm feeling so well now. Why would I add things in if I don't really enjoy them? It's not a big deal, you know? Yeah. So I think a carnivore diet can be a perfectly healthy diet. There's lots of great people out there. Um, Amber O'Hearn, um, you know, who are talking about Sean Baker. Mm -hmm. There's so many people who are, who are carnivore now, Ken Berry. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be a really healthy diet. My only concern is if somebody's come from like those paleo or keto stratospheric kind of oxalate intake, there could be a bumpy reentry if they're going. Yeah, right and I think, and I think that too, saying you're going to have other, and and I think there's like you said, varieties of spice of life too. Is that you know sometimes you want to have avocado, sometimes you want to have a salad, sometimes you want to have you know something else with it. As long as you're tolerating it, okay, and you're not getting ill effects, then you say okay. But some people I have, they'll say, yeah, every time I eat broccoli, I feel like garbage for a while, or or you know have spinach. I feel terrible. Then you realize, okay, maybe we just substitute something else and see what happens or cut it all out for a while and see how you feel and then add in things back in, you know, like an elimination type diet. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things with oxalate, one of the reasons I knew it was such a game changer for me is that I had already been keto. All I did was cut out the oxalate and then everything started to move. So if you're just pulling one lever and you know exactly what lever you're pulling, um, that can be a way for people to test things too. So somebody's not doing on keto exactly as they'd like, right? Let's say pull out spinach, you know, pull out uh, chard, almonds. pull out almonds, right? Yeah, see what happens. And see what happens. And it here's what often happens for people when they get on the diet. So this is this would be helpful for people to understand. You can often have like a honeymoon period. I did. I had like two weeks where I was like, oh, like it was, like life was beautiful and perfect and birds were singing and then oxalate dumping started. And then I, and, and, and so you kind of have to be ready to see, like, did I change my diet? And it swung somehow. Maybe I felt crappy. I changed my diet or maybe I felt good and then I felt crappy, but that kind of thing where you only pulled one lever and then all sorts of things happened, that I think is is probably the best pragmatic test I can perform on myself kind of thing. So when you're oxalate dumping, like what are, are your symptoms the same as they were before you started cutting oxalates? Do they start coming back? Is that basically what you're seeing? Generally. Histamine so, responses and Histamine fatigue responses, and, yeah. fatigue, like, because the oxalate's moving, it's getting that second kick at the can to drive inflammation, to impact tissues, to to do its, to have its fun, right? <laughs> as it's, yeah, as yeah. It's leaving. Yeah. So uh, very often it's this, it's the symptoms you started with that get triggered. It's not always all of them. So it, you know, what I found really helpful to keep me on the on the rails right away was that my digestion just kept improving. So I would occasionally get spikes where I had problems with my sleep or I would, or I would have fatigue or 
um, my thyroid might be a bit low, but then I, then, then it would all swing back again and yeah. life was good, but my, my digestion just got better. And that was, that, that really helped me to stick with it. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, when people, if people want to track you down, how do they find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter as low ox coach one. Um, you can find me on Instagram as low ox coach. And, uh, I am on Facebook. I do still you know, volunteer with this big support group called Trying Low Oxalates. It's the brainchild of Susan Owens, who's, you know, biomedical researcher. She runs with the, 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 the science crowd. I do the pragmatic stuff. Um, and I do have a website, lowoxcoach.com. And if you want more information on my my call on the oxalate dirty dozen i have a couple of articles there that'll that'll tell you the big bad guys that you might want to start out of learning. yeah that's great and, and you also have youtube videos and things like that that you've done i'm just getting my and, youtube yeah. channel kind of going oh and i'm 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 doing a joint venture with two other women who've also been involved in the low oxalate world for a long time between the three of us we have 45 years experience so um, and we call ourselves the Wizards of Ox. Oh, great. So Perfect. It's fun. It's sassy. <laughs> and we are starting, uh, we've got a, a YouTube channel started. And so you get all three of us. And so it's kind of a panel. We'll share different experiences. We do different topics. We've been trying to do that on Mondays every week. Um, if people wanted to try and sit in live, they can get the link through the Trying Low Oxalate support group on Facebook, but they can always see the videos on the YouTube channel. Um, but that's to try and get more of this sort of more basic information so that people can understand what they're getting into. And, um, you know, even to have a little bit of conversation about what it might look like, how do you do the diet? Uh, we haven't even touched on endogenous product, production of oxalate versus exogenous, which is from the diet or from vitamin C. There's so many. There's so yeah, many we'll topics. get you back and we'll talk about those things. I, I, I want to be respectful of your time. But yeah, I would love anything else you want to talk about. We'll do that. We'll, we'll, we'll have a repeat date on this because it, it's such a really important topic that no one's talking about. No one's everyone's kind of neglecting. So I have to ask you, since this is life's best medicine, what's life's best medicine for you, Monique? Like, what gets you going? What gets you excited? Where do you go to when things are terrible or whatever, just to give some words of wisdom to our listeners? Yeah. Well, for sure, for me, life's best medicine has to be following my passion. So doing this work is less about um, making a living than making a life, if I could say that. Mm -hmm. um, so... So certainly from my standpoint, that the best medicine ever has been, you know, mindset has been, you know, really wanting to bring the best of myself to the world. And, and that's what gets me up, you know, wanting to be the best, uh, you know, wife to my husband, wanting to be the best mother to my kids, wanting to be the best nutritionist to my clients, wanting to help other people dodge the bullet that I like that almost took me down, so to speak. Like those kinds of things are what gets me up in the morning and, you know, keeps me, keeps me, um, you know, really enjoying my life and engaged with my life and, and bringing my best to it. Awesome. Awesome. And that's it. Like if you have a passion for what you love to do and you're interesting, whenever you see a top, there's certain topics I want to read all about and I can't wait to dive into. And other ones like, oh, I don't really want to talk about hemorrhoids for two years, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> so, you know, there's certain people, but that's their passion to help people with hemorrhoids, whatever. But, you know, Which I think it's perfect. one of those things. And you we want yeah, yeah. them to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. You so, find your niche and what you enjoy and you go, okay, I'm going all in on this topic and, and you know, having a passion for it. And I see that in you. I see your excitement and joy and, and, and glow and all that. So everyone listening, this is important stuff, you know? Like I always say, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, but also find your passion, find what you enjoy. And if you're feeling miserable and tired and achy and hurting, you know, consider oxalates. Consider that. If you're doing low carb and you're not doing great, you know, a lot of us low carb docs say, well, they're cheating if they don't feel better because it, it has to fix everything. So you start looking at other options and saying, okay, could it possibly be oxalates? Could it be you're sensitive to certain foods? And then, you know, 
experimenting on yourself and juggling it a little bit and saying, okay, let me cut one thing out and see how I feel and then add things in and, you know, all those kind of things. So Monique, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me. You know, everyone have a great week and uh, we'll do this again. Thanks, Brian. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this episode. We greatly appreciate your support. We would greatly appreciate a positive thumbs up on all of the platforms like uh, iTunes and uh, Spotify or wherever you're listening. And we just thank you for our Patreon supporters. Uh, we greatly appreciate yeah, your help in getting this message out. We think there's a lot of important information. And uh, hopefully this helps you. You know, Have a great day and thank you for listening and thank you for your support. Thank you.